My father-in-law just passed away. Can you come home as soon as possible? I got the call from my daughter-in-law, Emilia, while my son was taking a bath during a family visit. With an anxious tone, she informed me about my husband's death. Confused and shocked, I yelled into the phone. Wait a minute. My name is Janie. I am 51, and ever since the sudden loss of my husband, I've been raising our son Kobe as a single mom. Kobe, who was in high school at the time, has now graduated college and has been working for three years. After getting his job, he moved out and started living on his own. Now he's married and he and his wife help each other to make a good life. His wife Emilia is on the quiet side and is, according to Kobe, good at household chores, a good wife. However, from the first time we met, she seemed distant, like she wanted to keep space between us. I mentioned it to Kobe, but he just laughed it off, saying it was all in my head, but I couldn't shake off the feeling. Emilia seems like she'd prefer to avoid our home. She only shows up for Thanksgiving and leaves without spending the night which only confirms my suspicion. Kobe is my only son, and I had always hoped to get along with his wife. I've even asked Emilia directly if there was something bothering her. Being as gentle as possible, I asked if I had done anything to make her uncomfortable. She simply replied, No, nothing at all. I eventually gave up on getting close to Emilia, thinking it's just the way younger people feel nowadays. They don't want to mingle with their in-laws, even if they live separately. What's more, I sensed a similar distance with Amelia's own parents when we met for the first time at the wedding. I mentioned to them that my husband had passed away years ago, and it seemed to create even more of a gap. Even though Kobe had told them from the beginning that I was a single mom, maybe seeing it firsthand created some negative impression of me. So, I've decided not to intrude on Kobe's marriage and quietly observed the wedding. Since then, the gap has enclosed between me, Amelia, and her family. Even though my son and his wife live relatively close, our family dynamics have become distant. Today, Kobe brought over some wedding photos, but of course, Amelia was nowhere to be seen. I feel grateful when I see Kobe, noticing my disappointment, offered to stay over tonight even though he's alone. Makes me proud to see how kind-hearted he's become. Looking at the picture of Amelia, I find myself smiling, thinking how pretty she looks when she's laughing next to Kobe. It's tough to suppress the loneliness when my own daughter-in-law avoids me for reasons I can't understand, even though we're still getting along. After carefully storing the photo and having dinner, I idly flip through a TV variety show. I'm waiting for Kobe to finish his shower when a familiar melody rings out. It's coming from Kobe's phone, left on the table. It's the default ringtone. Curiously, I glance at the phone. It's a call from Amelia. I decide to let Kobe know about it later and turn back to the TV, but then the phone starts ringing again. Given the incessant calls, I think it might be urgent, but hesitate to answer it myself. I reluctantly grab the still ringing phone and head to the bathroom to tell Kobe. Kobe, Emilia's calling. The phone's been ringing a few times now. I subtly hint for him to pick up, but Kobe brushes it off, saying it's fine. Charge it for me, will ya? Got any snacks? I could go for a drink after my shower. I'll be out soon. Grab something quick. Well, you're really becoming like your dad, aren't you? Holding the phone, I head back to the living room and try to plug it in. But I fumble and accidentally hit the answer button. In my rush to hang up, I hit the speaker instead, and Amelia's frantic voice bursts out. Can you hear me? Dad has passed away. Come home as soon as possible. It looks like I've picked up a very serious call. What do I say to Amelia, who's just lost her dad? Or should I first apologize for answering her call, even if it was an accident? My mind is racing, and I've lost sight of the option to hang up. Meanwhile, Amelia starts explaining the situation, saying that I need to come over to the nursing home where he was living. Startled, I ask when he had moved into a nursing home, considering he was fine until recently. Huh? Mother-in-law? 
Emilia had no idea that it was me on the line. She thought she was talking to Kobe, so her surprise makes sense. I quickly explain the situation and steer the conversation back to her dad. But she corrects me, slightly annoyed. It's not my dad. She says it's Kobe's father who has passed away and asks me to tell him to call her back before trying to hang up. I was utterly confused, but quickly spoke into the phone, still on speaker mode. Wait a second, Amelia, isn't this some kind of mistake? Like I told you before, Kobe's dad passed away eight years ago. Amelia seemed shocked by my statement. She stuttered momentarily, but quickly regained her composure. Now is not the time for lies. Why would you lie about something so heartless at a time like this? Before I could make sense of Amelia's sudden accusation of me lying, the room fell silent. In that moment, I noticed that Kobe, his face pale, was holding the phone. The call had ended. He had likely rushed over after hearing our heated conversation while taking a shower. Water was still dripping from his hair. It was clear that he'd hurriedly grabbed the phone. I asked Kobe, who was deliberately avoiding eye contact with me, what was going on. What did Emilia mean when she said your father just passed away? I had made it clear to her before we got married that your father had passed. Why would she think otherwise? When I pressed Kobe, who was visibly uneasy, he dodged my questions. Whether it was a misunderstanding on Emilia's part or someone who was like a father to him, it was clear he was hiding something. We'd been having a tense exchange for a while. Amidst this, Kobe's cell phone buzzed. The caller ID showed an unfamiliar name, but it looked like it was probably from a nursing home. While Kobe hesitated to pick up, knowing what to expect from the call, he eventually answered right in front of me. Trying to remain silent, I listened in. I could hear most of the conversation, and the caller indeed confirmed what Amelia had been saying. After ending the call, Kobe looked straight into my eyes and finally came clean, leaving me nearly faint. Apparently, he had introduced Amelia to a man unrelated to the family as his father. I told Amelia that mom cheated and got divorced, he said. It seemed Kobe had completely fabricated the story for Amelia. According to this version, I had neglected my husband's suffering from early onset dementia, had an affair, and was the one who was served with divorce papers. But due to issues like alimony, I had dragged out the discussions. Eventually taking advantage of the progression of my husband's condition, I forced him into a nursing home and pushed all the costs and responsibilities onto my son. After agreeing to the divorce, my ex-husband's dementia had already progressed to the point where the issue of compensation for the affair was swept under the rug. Kobe, who lied about our divorce to his parents-in-law, was careful not to show Emilia his marriage certificate when he submitted it. Listening to this story, my mouth was hanging open in disbelief. So, I told them mom has been going around telling people dad is dead. She's probably telling Emilia the same thing, but it's all lies, he explained. I can't believe he's been telling such elaborate lies. No wonder Emilia and my in-laws don't think highly of me. When I scolded Kobe for lying, he hung his head like a scolded child and mumbled that he wanted extra money for leisure. He thought he could lessen the amount he gives to Emilia by saying he was using it to pay for his father's care home. And shockingly, Kobe even aimed to inherit fake assets from another man. Kobe, who works as a caregiver, met a man with dementia who was a landlord when he went to assist at another facility. Although the man was not yet 70, he had multiple health issues and had entered the facility to receive end-of-life care. The man likely had early-onset dementia and had deteriorated to the point where he didn't even recognize his real son. Kobe took advantage of this and started to act like he was the man's only son. On top of that, using his role as a caretaker, he had the man's real family pay for his residential fees. Meanwhile, he was also pocketing a few hundred dollars every month as caregiving fees for doing small tasks. All of you must be so busy, 
Don't worry, I'll take good care of him, he would say. Sometimes he'd even lie about the man's health to minimize family visits. Whenever he found the time, he would sit beside the man, even going so far as to have him write a will leaving all his inheritance to Kobe. Kobe's manipulative ways gained him the trust of the facility, as he even told them that he had lost contact with his father since our divorce. The real family eventually stopped showing up, and even the facility staff started recognizing Kobe as a family member. Listening to this appalling truth coming from my son made me wonder if he really was my son. Now that the man had passed away, there wasn't much that could be done. I forced myself to tell a remorseful-looking Kobe to quickly inform the real family of the man's passing. Later, I took Kobe to apologize to the real family, and when they heard the truth, they were understandably furious. We will sue you for fraud, they yelled. Kobe politely apologized and pleaded to avoid a lawsuit, saying they could nullify the will, but this only enraged the family even more. From the family's perspective, nullifying the will was a given. Nothing had been resolved, including the caregiving fees and the manipulation of the deceased. Kobe, who seemed to think a simple apology would suffice, was at a loss in the face of the family's blazing anger and clung to me, nearly in tears. Going to court is impossible. Mom, you know it too, right? I don't have money to pay for damages. I've told you everything, help me. A mother always defends her child, doesn't she? I can't say I'm completely unaffected by the desperate plea from the son I've raised for over 20 years, but I have no intention of helping him. He's done something truly awful. I believe he needs to face the full wrath of the family and offer a sincere apology from the bottom of his heart. I apologized deeply, just like Kobe had, and all I could do was show my sorrow to the family as a parent. From that point on, Kobe's life spiraled downward. Emilia, who was his wife, filed for a quick divorce and returned to her parents' home. When faced with the prospect of divorce for lying so egregiously and swindling money from others, Kobe argued back. I don't want to break up, the money was also for Emilia. When they expressed their wish for a swift divorce and even threatened legal action and financial claims, Kobe had no choice but to back down. He knew that he could be in legal trouble for what he'd done. Although no claims had yet been made, he was being sued by the family of the deceased man. Perhaps he realized that he wouldn't be able to handle additional claims from Amelia. Furthermore, Kobe got fired from his job. The company claimed he damaged their reputation and shattered their trust in caregivers. After the court's decision, Kobe was required to pay back the caregiving fees he had received, as well as compensation for the emotional suffering of the deceased man's family. The well left by the deceased man was invalidated, taking into account the progress of his dementia. Kobe, who had almost no savings and was already unemployed, was now burdened with massive payments, including legal fees. Choosing city life for better job prospects, he rented a small, old apartment. He's barely making ends meet through day labor, trying hard to continue payments. He had reached out to me for help multiple times. Each time, I told him I had already helped enough by co-signing his lease and urged him to reflect on his mistakes. Now, juggling multiple jobs and searching for better paying work, he doesn't even have the time to complain. As for me, I continue to live alone. However, Emilia and her parents graciously visited me to apologize. They said they were sorry for their ill-mannered behavior, which was based on a misunderstanding of me. But I knew it was all my son's fault. We left it at that, acknowledging the unresolved issues between us. Since there were no children and the divorce was finalized, I don't expect to meet Emilia again. However, we still exchange seasonal greetings through letters.